One second, you guys. I'm on my way to the bench here. Well, how y'all doing tonight? Or today, or whenever you're viewing. Maybe it's 6.30 in the morning. I have no idea. You guys, I really appreciate you for tuning into my channel, and I hope today we can learn together and talk about reloading. And uh, I was going to get into precision rifle and using the powder trickler and just really making accurate rounds, and trust me, that's coming. But I wanted to start this video, I'm doing part three in reloading today, and there's so much more to talk about pistol before I move on. And uh, today we're going to make some full house 357 magnums. So 357 magnum is, a, is an awesome round, you guys. It's a lot of horsepower. You can get up to 870 foot pounds in a 357 magnum. Uh, I've even bought ammunition with that, with specs like that. So let's start just by talking about the brass you guys right here well before the brass let me just show you here's my 357 magnum this is an astra and this is just a beautiful pistol it's an astra 357 and this is my favorite 357 to me this is like the python or something in my eyes i mean i just this is a beautiful gun it has never failed me. I don't think it ever could. It has recessed cylinders. Uh, just a beautiful gun. You guys, I've actually done a video on this. I can't find fault in this gun. I'm typically a Smith guy. I was considering buying a Colt King Cobra a little while back because you can get one brand new for about $1,000 right now. 930 if you're lucky, if you find it on sale. But... uh it's just a fun gun to shoot and just for for history i mean they wanted more power they wanted to step up the 38 and get a little bit more horsepower out of it you know law enforcement auto body there was just a need for a more powerful 30 30 uh 38 caliber nine millimeter roughly size bullet back in the day you know i'm i'm, I'm staying rough here I know there's exact dimensions on bullet diameter for each, but you know, roughly 38 and 9 millimeter are the same. But you buy a different bullet when you go to load it because it's it's a little different. It's about the same though. Now, the brass that I'm uh, that I'm going to be using today, you guys, is brass that I've just recovered from my local range. Most of it's mine, just from factory loads, PPU, uh, Remington green and white box. Uh, now there's two powders that I'm going to talk about and normally I never have two powders on the bench but for purposes of this video I want to talk about these two powders we have HP 38 and we have accurate number nine now the HP 38 uh, for the 357 Magnum it says you can use seven grains with 150 grain bullet and you're going to do about 1269 feet per second now, since I'm using 125 grain bullets today, you actually can, can load up to 8.4 grains. And that's what these are right here. There are 357 Magnums that I've made in the past with 125 grain hard cast. And I'm using 8.4 grains of HP 38. And this gives me a velocity of about 1375. So still a little bit on the low end but definitely a 357 magnum and this is what i'm using right now now i'm going to make some true magnums today and while hp 38 is a versatile power powder and it's really an efficient powder you get lots of bang for your buck i use this with 38 specials and 45 acp mainly but i've, I've even loaded 44 magnum with this powder you guys and i've had great results it is a good versatile powder it's just a little bit goes a long way it's a fast burning powder now here's a little bit slower burning powder but more a magnum powder and this is going to benefit more with your longer barrels like like the pistol that i just showed you this astra it's not a stub nose you actually get some barrel length there and that longer barrel definitely benefits from a little bit slower burning magnum powder but it's still a fast burning pistol powder make no mistake if this accidentally made its way or was left in your in your hopper up here and you went to reload some 308 or something your gun's going to blow up and you're going to lose half of your face so you, you need to be very consistent in all that you do and safety checking and verifying 
And now that I've shown you guys this powder, I'm actually going to take it off my desk and just throw it, throw it down the hallway because I only keep one powder on the desk. And the powder that's in my hopper is this Accurate number 9. Now, I've never had an accident with a powder, but I did do this one time. I had two powders on the desk, and I went to unscrew my hopper at the end of the night, and I went to pour the powder back into the canister. I was absent-minded, it was late, and I poured rifle powder into a can of pistol powder. I noticed it the moment I started doing it. I still have that can of powder. Uh, I'll probably never use it for anything other than fertilizing the rose garden. But I'm making the point, it's best to keep one can of powder on your desk for safety purposes. Now let me just go ahead and, and move you guys in just a little bit here. So I have my scales set up here. And I have it at 14 grains, and right now I'm going to verify the zero. You always zero your scale before you do anything. Now, I know y'all can't see exactly, but that scale, that scale is perfectly zeroed right now. We're perfectly on the zero. Uh, so now what we're going to do, I have this little cup here, nothing in it, and that just makes it simple for me. I'm going to rotate it twice like a normal procedure, up, down. Now I've already pre-measured this, and according to the Hodgkin's website, with a 125 grain bullet, which is what we're gonna be using today, the maximum load for the 38 Special with accurate number nine with a 125 grain lead bullet is 14 grains. So now we're gonna go to 10, and now we're gonna go to 14, right there. And as you can see, I just poured that and we are perfectly centered at 14 grains right there. That is just perfect. So this little powder throw, it is a precise tool, but I'll show you a secret. This powder, it's, it's, it's kind of a ball powder. It's very fine. And this powder, let me get a close up on that. If I can get it here. Well, you see it, it's just a very fine ball powder. And this powder is very good. It, it, you know, it just matches perfectly with this system. You know, when you put stick powder in here, I've had it sometimes, not all of it will fall, and then you touch the handle and some falls out. Like uh, with IMR 3031. Here, let me, let me move you all back just a little bit here. Like with IMR 3031, I've had this happen before where the stick powder is kind of hung up in there. So, but when you're using a fine ball powder, like with the Accurate Company here, very, very uh, symmetrical, very consistent. It, it just matches well with this, with this powder throw. So what we're going to do, we're going to move right into it. Now I'm 100% sure this is this powder. I've, I just brought that one in here to show you guys a load that I've used in the past. And the only other thing I need to talk about is brass. Uh, the 357 Magnum. Brass is actually, it's quite expensive actually. Now I probably only have 50 or so rounds here. And shortly before I started making this video, I loaded a few just to get my equipment perfectly set up before I started the video. But uh, 357 Magnum Brass, I'm just going to get into it here. Go into my size die. Coming up. I move my chair slightly. We just spit our old primer. Coming back down. Now the second die here is going to, it's going to pretty much, if there is any imperfection in the case, it's going to take that out. And then what it's also going to do, this is the section that I prime. So let me go ahead and do that. There, I just primed the case. And I'll show you what that did. It kind of put a little bit of a bulb on the neck. I don't know. I know this is a dark case, you guys. This is an old case that I just found at the range. But uh, the new primers in there just perfectly. And the primers that I'm using today are those, uh, well, they're from, they're from Argentina. But they've been surefire 100%. They're about 10 cents a piece. I think I bought 4,000 of them when I did. So now we're going to come to the powder. Up, down. Now we're going to grab our bullet, which is the 125 grain SNS. This is a, a filled point. 
real good bullet for penetration. Now we're going to come up, and I've set this die to where it crimps right at the neck. Now, you guys, this is ugly brass. This is just ugly, through, you know, but it's been fully, fully, uh, fully sized on my first die there. When I decapped, I fully sized it, and that is perfectly in spec, and I normally don't do this, but I'll show you. If you look right there, watch this. Perfect. Recessed. It's completely in there. Just perfect. Now I'm going to go ahead and punch that out. Because I'm not going to leave this gun loaded at the moment. But this old brass shoots just fine. You can get 30 or 40 reloads out of a piece of brass like this. Now it can go right here to my box. Yep. So the thing about 357, the last time I saw it in stores, you guys, and I'm in Texas, it was somewhere between 35 and 47 dollars for 50 round for a 50 round box, which is what this would be if it was full. So you're really you're spending about a dollar a shot, or, or very close to it, um, which is just outrageous. The primer's costing me 10 cents. I'm using 14 grains of accurate number nine, which is the maximum load for a 125 grain bullet, according to Hodgkin's website. So this is the max load. It's gonna give me about 1,575 feet per second, and uh, which is a good stout hot load. Now, one thing I'll say, the brass for 357 Magnums is quite expensive. Let me just give you an example. Here's a company right here called Northwest Iowa Brass. And they would sell this in a 500 count for around, it was like $44 or $40 or something. And it's polished, clean brass. Now, I've already reloaded a lot. When you first, I have three bags of it here. This one's full, it hasn't even been opened, but there's 500 in this bag. And I have another one, I bought 15, Excuse me. I bought 1,500 rounds of the stuff, and uh, it's it's a lot cheaper than th 357 Magnum brass costs like three times as much, and it's it's silly to me because uh, here's a 38 special. Let me just just balance these on my hand here so you can see the difference. If you notice, the 357 Magnum is just a little bit bigger, just a little bit bigger. But the whole purpose of that is so you don't accidentally get a 357 Magnum in your 38. Now I can actually take this 38 special and I, I kid you not, I can come up here and just for, for instance, I just drop powder in it. And you can see even with the 14 grains of powder, there is still ample case capacity there. Uh, I don't want to spill it out here. Well, some might spill, but I'm just, just take my word for it. There's there's plenty of case capacity left that I could seat a bullet on here. Now, this I'd even decap. I'm just I'm giving an example. I'm not I'm not making 357s in 38 special brass. I could, but I highly uh, I avoid that at all costs because the danger there. If somebody got a hold of your 38 specials that were actually loaded to full house 357 Magnum, they're gonna blow their gun up in their face, and that's terrible. So, there, you know, unless unless all you own is a 357 Magnum, don't do it. And then even if you do only own a 357 Magnum, in the future, 10 years down the line, you might be tempted to buy a 38. And then somehow one of those hot 357 Magnums that was in the 38 case found its way into your gun, and then you blow up because you forgot. It's just a it, it's a it's a bad idea, but you can do it. I've done it before. I shot every one of them the next day just to see if it would work. It, it worked perfectly with flying colors. I had no splitting. It Really, they're, they're the same strength. It's just that little bit of length. So it just kind of hurts me because if, if I wanted to buy 1,500 rounds of 357, uh, it would literally cost me three times as much. I think I got the 1,500 rounds of Polish 38 for like, and th this is in 2022 prices, you guys. It's like 100 and 28 bucks or something shipped so uh 
I wish I could get three 357 Magnum brass for that price, but I can't. And for safety reasons, I only load 357 Magnum in a 357 case. But we'll go ahead and do the process again here. Now, the brass, this is just brass that I saved. So right now we're sizing. We just popped our old primer. Now we're coming down. We've done a full case size. Now we're coming back up. Stage two, we just slightly, I have it set up because I don't care to, to, to do it too much. You can really make it flower out at the top of that brass if you adjust this adjustment. See, with, with the 38, this is where I prime. That one gave me a little bit, of, little bit of grief, but see, I never prepared the back of that, but it primed it just fine. Now, I, I can fill it. I have it just ever so slightly. And the advantage here, I don't have to take a Lyman tool and do anything like this. And that's because my I have a die that preps it. It actually has a little piece that flowers out the top of that. And if I screw this down, like I said, it'll really flower it out. And then that, that just shortens the life of your brass. So next step is powder. Next step is bullet with a crimp. I have this this. For 357 Magnum, I strongly advise using a crimp. And I realize this is old brass, but you see the crimp line at the top there? Now, when you set your crimp, this is what you do. You look at your bullet, and those two pieces, come on camera, you want to pass, there it is. Quit focusing on me. I have got to get better camera equipment moving forward one day. Well, anyways, you want to crimp over those two lines and I've had this happen if you don't crimp like say you're using a Lee loader you're just sizing the neck I've been shooting before and I've had the bullets where they it pretty much looked like this you guys let me give an example here well I can't really I've had the bullets start coming out like that because they weren't crimped under the inertia and the recoil of the gun. So I had live rounds in the cylinder that because of the inertia were preventing the cylinder from rotating. So when you're shooting hot 357 Magnum, I strongly advise using a crimp. And these RCBS dies have the crimp where you can set right here. You can set up that crimp. So. I'll just run that process one more time here. So I'm going to take a piece of brass, put it in my case head, which in this case I'm using a number one Lee universal case head on this Lyman, this ancient, you know, Spartan six turret press. Now I'm going to come up into the die, just pop my old primer. It didn't make it into the bucket, it fell out. Now I'm going to go ahead and come back down, rotate. Now I just, uh, th this, this step here, I'm, I'm bulbing the top, so I, I don't need, I'm skipping this step. And in the process, there's like a piece inside that die that, say you had a little bit of a bent case, it cylinders it out perfect again. So that's step two. Now we're going to prime on that step. This part's always fun, but it went in just fine. Just fine. Normally I don't even check because it just... I can tell you can fill it up down there's my powder now we're going to bullet there we are with the crimp and that's not going to move at all until fired and these will these will chronograph i'm sure over 1500 feet per second so I could sit here and go through the rest of the box, but I'll save you all from doing that. And uh, let me just finish up this video and just conclude. So how cost effective is this? Well, if you have some brass lying around, like I said, you can you can reload this stuff for for a long time if you take care of your brass. Probably 40 to 60 reloads out of it if you're taking care of your brass. Now. These, some of this brass, like if you look at this one, it's so tarnished and dark. I mean, it's just, it's almost blackened. But let me show you something. It still reloads no problem at all. There's no need, look at that. 
just pop the old primer, stage two. You'll see the coloration of the brass after I prime it here. Look at that, simple. That one went in simple. Look, at, it almost looks like a steel case because that brass is so dark. But that's not going to affect accuracy. That's not going to affect anything. There's powder. Now you want to make darn sure not to double load. I normally don't pull them off the press, but I'm paying attention to what I'm doing. Even this old brass works just fine. Really, if you clean it up, that's just that's just aesthetics. It's not going to change the function. You know, some of these are there's stains on them and stuff. It it doesn't matter. That's just I could take brasso and just drop a couple drops when I'm tumbling it. If if I tumble it, some of these I did, some of them I didn't. But I did use case lube in a in a plastic bag. So I sprayed some of that in the bag and shook it up before I got to the to the loading die here. So but back to being cost effective. I can make these bullets are real cheap. I get them in a thousand round box for like seventy six bucks for a thousand hundred and twenty five grain bullets from SNS casting. So the bullet's cheap. You know, I don't know what is that like. It's like six or seven cents. The primer is ten cents. Ten cents for my primers. Six or seven cents for the bullet. We'll just say seven. Uh, so I'm at seventeen cents for my powder. Now, if I'm using accurate number nine, I'm using 14 grains because I want a full house load. But if I'm using that HP 38 that, I, that I've that uh, i chunked off my bench, then I'm only using, I want to say, 8.4 grains with a 125 grain. And that's correct. 8.4 grains with HP 38. So I'm actually, I'm getting a more, it's a faster burning powder. It's It's more efficient but it's not quite as good for our true Magnum. Some of these Magnum pistol powders that Accurate makes are better. So, and they're gonna give me higher velocity and a, a better recoil and pulse. It's just, uh, I really like Accurate number nine. So, uh, it just depends. You know, that HP 38, I probably could make 3,000 rounds out of one pound of that. But with this, I might only get 1,800, you know, using 14 grains. I use the same powder in the 44 Magnum. I use about 20, 20 to 21 grains, if I remember right. You guys don't quote me on that. Check the load data always, but I, I think that's about right. So, uh, so anyways, when you look at it like that, because this here was $32, I think the HP 38 was like, I don't know, I think it was like $28 or something. So really, I'm getting 357 Magnum for 20 probably around 22 cents a shot, you guys, if I have my brass. So, and even if I buy brass with the 38 specials, uh, you know, let's say I was doing 38, I'm getting them for, you know, when I buy the brass, it's probably around a quarter a shot. And like I said, if I needed to, I could load these 357, but I'm not doing that because one of those rounds would work its way into a 38 and blow somebody up. It's just stupid, you, you know. I don't need to do that, but, and don't, because it'll happen to you. Trust me, I've heard stories. Uh, put it in the 357 brass. So, you guys, I just wanted to, to share that experience and just how this is done here. Uh, it's very cheap. It's very affordable to reload your 357 Magnum. You know, these little Lyman presses, I have a single press back here behind it. Like I said, these aren't that expensive. You can get into this, you're going to save a lot of money, but is it worth it to you? How many times do you go to the range? If you go twice a month, it's worse. It's definitely worth it for you. If you go twice a year, I don't think it's worth it. So you guys be the judge. Uh, I do have a scripture that I would like to share today, and uh, this is a powerful scripture, you guys. Just being a Christian, you know, the, the hope uh, that we have in Christ the hope that we have, the hope of eternal life. I know that next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. And today I have a, a, a particular scripture here in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians to be exact, exact. And I want to talk about, this is chapter 15, and you guys just bear with me. 
It is such a blessed hope to have forgiveness, to have grace, to know that you're saved, to know that if something happened to you, you have eternal life. And if you don't know you have eternal life, trust me, your, your life is eternal already. You're a eternal spirit. Uh, now, whether you're going to spend that life in glory and in bliss with your creator, or whether you're going to spend that, that life in a place that's not life at all, that's your choice. It's how you, you know, have you made that choice to follow Christ? And if so, well, amen. Good for you. And if you haven't, then I'll do all I can to persuade you that he's real and he loves you. But today we're talking about the resurrection. Now, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel with which I preach to you, which also you received and which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Paul, he gets into this area, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve, after he appeared to more than five hundred brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Now Paul uses this term, some have fallen asleep. He's talking about those that have passed away, those that have died. Even though their body is in the ground and decaying and and no more. The spirit is secured and kept and preserved by God. They've just fallen asleep. He's talking about the resurrection here. Then he appeared to James. Well, he's about to get into the resurrection. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to the one ultimately untimely born, he's referring to himself, he appeared to me also. This was the vision. For I am the least of the apostles, and am not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, his grace, and his grace towards me did not prove in vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God within me, whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, here we go. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Back then, people were saying there was no resurrection of the dead. Today, people just simply don't know. And I, I, I venture to say that today people are so distracted that it's almost as if they just continue on with life, which life is hard. So if you're going to live, you might as well live for Christ. Well, anyways, he's, and, and today people are unsure. I don't really hear people saying there is no resurrection. People just don't know. But if there is no, Paul, let me continue. Paul, he says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also in vain. Then he says, moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testify against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise. If in fact the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And we have hoped, and we who have hoped in Christ, and and if we have hoped in Christ, excuse me, guys, in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Paul, he, he's making a point here that if Christ was not raised from the dead, then your faith is in vain. Then everything you're hoping for is in vain. And this is the huge point that I'm trying to drive home about the resurrection of the dead here. Christ, he died and he died for all to put away sin once and for all. And through believing on him and believing in his name we too will be raised from the dead. And those that believed and placed their faith in Christ and have formerly died, they have not died. It's just the flesh. It's this outward tabernacle or temporal dwelling where our spirit resides. That is God's temple because God is in us too by Jesus Christ and through him. And the point of this is if Christ wasn't raised, well, 
Our hope is in vain. Our faith is in vain. Moreover, then, Christ didn't die for our sins because those that have died have perished and those that will die have perished. The faith, in this sense, has perished. But now, because Christ has been raised from the dead, this is, and Paul even says, had he not, then our, then apostles, you know, this is, these are men that gave away everything, that followed Christ without looking back in the slightest, having given up all things for. So Paul, he's aware of this. He would be, of all men, most to be pitied because he's preaching a false gospel that can't save anyone. But Christ, verse 20, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ is the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming. See, when the Lord will appear in the, in the sky and the shout of a trumpet with an archangel, like in the book of Revelation, at the return of Christ, and this trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ will spring forth. There will be a great resurrection of those who have fallen asleep. This is what I believe, and this is what the Bible teaches. And, and when we say, you know, a Christian was to die next week, his spirit is going to be escorted by angels into Abraham's bosom, which is symbolic of heaven, according to the synoptics. We learn that through the parables. But there will come a day when that body comes forth, resurrected, glorified, to be with Christ forever. And this is what's important. And I'm just going to stop right there. I could continue, you guys, but I'm not trying to get into a thick Bible study. You see, I get passionate about it. I love guns, but guns are in vain. <laughs> Everything's in vain if there's no life, if there's no eternal life. Uh, let me say this. These are just material things. I could get rid of them, and I have. I've sold many. I've traded up. I've done this or that. Sometimes I just was real religiously convicted. I can't tell you how many times in my collective past that I've, man, I, I sold a lot because I just felt, you know, I needed to pursue other things. It's It's been that way before. So now it's it's just a hobby. You know, there, there's another channel, The Preacher's Day Off, and I really like that. That makes sense. On his day off, he fools around at the reloading bench. I think this man has it figured out, so shout out to his channel. But uh, you guys, it's just a, it's a great blessing to know that we too have eternal life through Christ Jesus. And you know what? And glorify God in whatever your hand finds to do. Do wholeheartedly. If you're out shooting, then try to shoot your best and stay blessed, you guys. And just remember that that is the key point. Of, of resurrection or Easter Sunday, you know, these, these Easter words. I, I just, I found it so interesting that when I was in seminary that they use ancient Greek words for, uh, you know, hermeneutics, homiletics, or like, for instance, Hermes was a Greek messenger god. So hermeneutics would be the proper grasp and the proper way to explain and convey uh, to really understand God's word, to have a firm grasp on it. Hermeneutics, that was what the class was called. So they're using a Greek a Greek interpreter god, pretty much. Easter, I mean, that's not really a Christian thing, but, you know, I call it Resurrection Sunday. Easter Sunday is fine, but I'm just making the point. Christ is the center of all this, and since he was raised, we too have the hope of eternal life through him and by him. Having been reconciled to God, it's just all there. And that's the centerfold, and that's the hope of the believer you know, death was very unnatural. It came by sin, and in Adam all die, but in Christ all will be made alive. Well, you guys, I preached a little bit more than normal this time, and forgive me, but that just, it excites me, because honestly, everything would be in vain if you couldn't enjoy it and live with Christ forever one day, and, you know, be able to partake in those things that are good. So, well, I'm going to quit rambling on, you guys. Stay blessed. Be very careful with your powder. I am loading the max load. I, I want full house 357 Magnum. So I recommend starting at, you know, 12 or 13 grains instead of 14, unless you really know how to have the scoop just perfect. Well, until next time, you guys stay blessed and have a great day.